On the brink of a new era of BlackBerry, we felt it would be fitting to pay tribute to one of its most popular and successful smartphones of all time. I'm Taylor Martin, this is Pocket Now, and this is a throwback review of the BlackBerry Curve 8330. In 2007, BlackBerry OS was a serious heavyweight, and its creator, Research in Motion, was a thriving, successful company. At the time, RIM was valued at over $100 billion, and it seemed as if nothing could slow it down. Fast forward five years and the story is not quite as cheery as it once was. Now called BlackBerry, the company has spent the better part of the last half decade in front of a drawing board in an attempt to become relevant in the consumer space once again. The BlackBerry Playbook, QNX, BlackBerry 10 software, and related hardware such as the Z10 and Q10 have all effectively failed to do the job. And earlier this week, to little surprise, the company announced some major news. It's retreating from the consumer market and has agreed to go private thanks to a $4.7 billion offer from Fairfax Financial Holdings. The last few years have been quite bumpy, and BlackBerry as we know it will never be the same. So we thought it would be fitting to pay homage to the better days of BlackBerry with a throwback to one of the company's most successful and popular devices. It was May 1st, 2008, and Altel was the first US carrier to receive the latest BlackBerry model, the Curve 8330, the CDMA variant of the already popular 8300 series. For its time, the 8330 was a tiny device that packed a serious punch. It was an obvious push into the general consumer market from Research in Motion, which had primarily resided in the enterprise and prosumer markets leading up to the Curve and Pearl series. The Curve 8330, specifically, was the breadwinner for RIM in the consumer market. The Pearl with its 20-button smart-type keyboard was admittedly a bit strange, and the Bold still carried that business professional look not everyone wanted. The Curve was much more casual, and in comparison to its Windows Mobile counterparts, it was also a lot smaller. And it was very lightweight at only 113 grams, which can be attributed to the all-plastic build. In 2008, the Curve was a marvel. Its outer edges were coated in a soft-touch plastic. The front and back were gunmetal gray, at least on the original model. Silver, red, pink, as well as many other colors followed for various carriers and brands, including an all-black variant for Boost Mobile. The fixed focus camera, also found around back, only offered a max resolution of 2 megapixels, which never took the greatest pictures, but it did have an LED flash as well as a tiny mirror for self-shots. The front was a beautiful mess of buttons, 40 to be exact. Directly below the 2.5-inch 320x240 pixel resolution display rested dedicated call and end buttons, the standard BlackBerry key, which doubled as a menu key within apps, a back button, and a trackball for navigation. Anyone who used a trackball fitted BlackBerry shared mostly the same sentiments. It was a love-hate relationship. The trackball was an incredibly accurate way to navigate. It was nimble and easy to use, but dust would often get under the trackball and prevent it from rolling. Fortunately, it was an easy fix. Pop the plastic housing off and clean the area out with a Q-tip. This also made swapping out custom colored trackballs very easy. Below the navigation keys was the high point of the phone, the full QWERTY keyboard. The island keys were separated just enough for comfortable blind navigation, and they were perfectly rigid, though the travel of the keys was very short. Even to this day, after two and a half years of use and another three spent in a drawer, the keys still provide a firm, tactile, and audible click which came in handy when typing notes during my high school physics class instead of handwriting them. Yes, that's right, I said high school. By today's standard, this phone is too small, ugly, fat, and nearly useless. Its specifications are laughable. It came with only 32 megabytes of RAM and 96 megabytes of internal storage, which could be supplemented with a micro SD card. Its processor clocked in at 312 megahertz and was very slow, and its battery capacity was rated at 1150 milliamp hours. There was no Wi-Fi on board, though there was a GPS radio and Bluetooth 2.0 connectivity. It operated on EVDO. Yet thanks to the mandatory $30 monthly price for the BlackBerry internet service, which was unlimited, might we add, compressed web pages literally took minutes to load. And that gets us to software. It wasn't much to look at. The home screen consisted of four different layouts, which were accessible from the theme submenu and settings. All were little more than different icon layouts, though the Today View gave a preview of messages, missed calls, and calendar entries. And if you were inclined to do so, you could create your own BlackBerry themes or download custom themes from various sources. I created a few of my own, one of which can be seen here. The settings app was literally a text list with no design elements whatsoever. Staring at it today after being spoon-fed with visual cues and beautiful interface design for several years almost makes us dizzy. The high point of the BlackBerry software, however, was the email and the universal inbox. 
BlackBerry Internet Service, or Biz, delivered its famous push email mere seconds after an email was sent. It was an unbelievably reliable and efficient way to do email, especially in 2008. And the inbox, not terribly unlike Android's notification shade, makes third-party notifications, email, SMS, BBM, and everything else into a single, chronological stream of info. It was beautiful, and no software, not even today's BlackBerry Hub, quite captures the same utility as the old BlackBerry inbox. BlackBerry was all about productivity, no matter how much RIM wanted it to be consumer-based software. The interface was heavily engineered to adhere to the use it and put it back in your pocket mantra, how Blackberries were originally designed to be used. But the terms BlackBerry Addict and Crackberry have very obvious origins. You had to rely on the mobile web for everything and the few built-in apps to do your bidding. It wasn't until later in 2009 that BlackBerry OS actually had a dedicated application store. It launched April 1st, 2009, and it was called BlackBerry App World. Before that, one had to dig around various forums to find third-party applications for their BlackBerry. Looking back, the software is very rudimentary, but in 2008 it got the job done and it did so with flying colors. I personally remember spending hours playing games, writing school papers, emailing, taking notes, and browsing the web for my curve while my friends and family still had flip phones. Best of all, I was doing this for days on end on a single charge. I specifically remember only charging my phone two or three times per week, logging several hours of usage each day. On Altel, the Curve 8330 cost $329 with a two-year agreement, which was quite steep, even by today's standards. But make no mistake, this was a very important device in the transformation of the smartphone world, even if the iPhone gets most of the credit. Even to this day, the Curve 8330 has a special place in our hearts, and for me, it's like a trophy on my shelf, the phone that got me into this business and kickstarted my love for technology. That's going to do it folks for this video. If you enjoyed it, let us know by clicking the thumbs up button below and hit the subscribe button to see more videos like this one. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Google Plus at Pocket Now. I'm Taylor Martin and you can find me on Twitter at Casper Tech and I will see you next time.